that um, occurred on 15, 16 June of 2019. Um, it had two distinct areas of convection, one in the upper Midwest of the Ohio Valley and then another area in the Southern Great Plains. And so we initialized our model runs at 0Z on the 15th. Um, they were 48 hour forecasts with hourly output. And the big motivation behind um, why we wanted to investigate this is that um, the UFS short range weather app, um, and as we've heard throughout the week, they're planning their first um, public release uh, in November. It aims to deliver accurate forecasts for a variety of weather phenomenon, both high impact um, and routine weather that span a range of spatial and temporal scales. Um, and again, another overarching theme this week is that US uh, weather modeling uh, as a community is moving towards a more unified approach. Therefore, it, it does become necessary to understand how forecast performance uh, varies over a range of scales. And so we ran simulations at 25, 13, and three kilometers um, for several physics suites, which I'll go into on the next slide, to best determine the optimal grid spacing um, to represent the convective event that we were looking at. And we took it from a synoptic approach all the way down to the convective scales um, to understand um, how and why the different schemes were performing um, the way they were. So we produced a lot of results um, in, for this particular event. So today I'll just be focusing on precipitation-based analyses, but I would encourage anybody if they're interested in learning more to reach out to um, myself or any of the co-authors listed there to get in contact uh, to work with us. So the physics suites that we ran um, are listed below. We ran three GFS-based physics suites, um, but for time constraints, I'll just be focusing on results from the GFS version 16 beta suite today. And then we also ran two GSD-based suites. Um, and so I'll be focusing on, on what we're referring to as GSD NOAA. So it's like GSD V0, um, and it's a very wrap her like configuration. Um, however, we did swap out the um, LSM to be using NOAA. As you'll see, we ran, um, we initialized all of our runs with GFS ICBCs, and we did notice a strong sensitivity to the land surface model that we used. And just as a note, in the public release, um, this will be shifting towards what's called the RRFS, or Rapid Refresh Forecast System. Um, but when we ran um, our specific configurations, we were referring to them as GSD-based suites. I also want to note that the suites um, are rapidly updating. And so we ran these runs um, several months ago. And so there have been a lot of um, both technical and scientific changes. So we'll look to rerun our cases with the most up-to-date code in the coming weeks. So a little bit more background on the case itself. As I mentioned, there was two distinct areas of convection. Uh, the northern area was more strongly forced. And there were some areas that had higher cape and or shear. So as you see from the SBC storm reports in the upper right, um, there were some um, tornado reports as well as high wind and a few hail cases. Um, so there were some supercellular structures associated with this area of convection. The southern convection was a little weaker forced and it did have um, a deeper and drier PBL. And so you'll see there was a lot more wind reports. Um, and in the coming slide, you'll see um, there was a bow echo that traversed across um, Oklahoma. So now for the next couple of slides, I'll focus on the GFS based um, results and then I'll shift to the GSD after that. But we'll be showing the same set of plots. So first we'll be showing composite reflectivity and then accumulated precipitation. Then we'll be looking at um, precipitation partitions. Uh, so first we'll look at composite reflectivity. We'll specifically be looking at forecast hour 30, which is valid at 60 on the 16th. And we'll be subjectively comparing against the MRMS data, um, which you can see in the upper left. So at this time there was a bow echo um, in Oklahoma. And then there was some convection um, in Illinois that um, was associated with a surface front that was sweeping through Missouri. And I'm really going to focus mostly on the three kilometer runs as that's where we would obviously see some of um, the more convective type um, ability to, to resolve the bow echo. And so we do see um, a bow echo in the GFS based physics suite. Um, it had good timing and placement for this particular run. Um, the convection in the north part though, however, was a little displaced to the south and was a little bit too strong, um, but it did do fairly well with the convection associated with the surface front in Missouri. One thing I do want to point out <clears throat> that we plan on looking to more in year two is that both of these areas of convection did have deficient trailing stratiform regions, um, which likely might be linked back to the microphysics that was used. So this is something, um, again, that we'll be looking into more um, throughout the next year. So now we um, be focusing on the one hour accumulated precipitation. We'll be using CCPA as truth in this case. I mean, actually, I'm going to just advance to the next slide um, and I'll toggle back and forth so we can get an idea of how um, the partitions compare to the, the total accumulation. But these are precipitation partitions. Um, and the method of looking at this was taken from a paper in 2019. And so basically, um, on a grid cell by grid cell basis, you can get an idea of whether the precipitation is mostly coming from um, the resolved or microphysics scheme or the subgrid partition coming from the convective scheme. Um, and so the purples are going to represent the resolved. And then as that transitions to the green, that's going to then um, move towards um, being more, having more um, influence from the subgrid scale. And we would assume that going from 25 to 13 to three kilometers, we would see a transition um, to having more resolved convection. 
Um, so some key takeaways from this at 25 and 13 kilometers, um, we do see um, a relatively similar distribution in the partitions between the two runs. Um, whereas at three kilometers, most of the precipitation is resolved. Um, and typically the areas of active convective, um, active convection and or areas of higher precip are primarily dominated by the microphysics scheme, so it's more resolved. Whereas areas of weaker convection and or low precipitation accumulations tend to be um, dominated by the cumulus scheme. Um, and one thing I wanna call your attention to is obviously in the three kilometer runs, um, you can see over the conus, most of the precipitation um, is resolved, whereas we do see this area off the southeast coast that's more subgrid. And if we go back to the previous slide, um, we do see a lot of that is associated with the weaker um, accumulations. And so that's something else that we um, might look into more in the coming year. Um, and then another way to look at the partitions is um, through these time series of looking at the area average subgrid precipitation and the convective ratios. So I do wanna note that for these particular set of plots, we put everything on the 25 kilometer grid. Um, so there was some interpolation for the 13 and three kilometer runs. So for the plot on the left, um, we see the CCPA total in the black line here. And then uh, the totals for the three, 13 and 25 are the solid lines in green, red and blue um, respectively. And then the precipitation from the subgrid partition is in the dashed lines. Just a few takeaways from this. We do see for the three kilometer runs, especially during areas of active convection, um, the three kilometer runs tend to overestimate or over predict um, the precipitation. Um, whereas the 25 and 13 actually do a fairly decent job um, of getting the amounts, especially during the event that we were um, most interested in. Oh, awesome. Let me restart PowerPoint real fast. Sorry about that. The timing was impeccable. I'm getting a new work computer tomorrow, so it wasn't quite enough time. All right, sorry about that little PowerPoint snafu there. All right. All right, so then I'll skip over to the plot with the convective ratio. Um, so we would imagine that um, the convective ratio, so this is the part that comes from the, the convective precip, the cumulus scheme, um, would be higher for the, um, the 25 and 13 kilometer runs, and we do see that. Um, we don't see much difference between the 25 and 13 kilometer runs, so that's kind of an interesting finding. Um, where we do see very low convective ratios for the three kilometer run, so not a lot of the precipitation is coming from the convective scheme, which was confirmed by the spatial plots we saw in the previous slide. Um, so now I'm showing some results from the GSD NOAA runs. Uh, we'll be looking at the 27 hour forecast time, which is valid at 3Z on the 16th. Again, we have the MRMS data in the upper left and then 25, 13, and three kilometers. Um, I do wanna point out that the 25 and 13 kilometer runs did have some relatively strong storms um, in the general location of where the bow echo was um, in Oklahoma. Um, I also wanna point out that in the 13 kilometer runs, uh, it was generally devoid of precipitation or strong, precip or strong reflectivity values um, where the, the Northern convection was occurring um, at this particular You've forecast. Got a time. couple minutes left. Oh, perfect, all right. Um, and then the three kilometer run does an excellent job of getting the bow echo, um, does a fairly good job of getting the northern convection, although the convection in Missouri is a little displaced to the south. Um, I do wanna point out that similar to the GFS, we also see deficient trailing stratiform region. Um, so again, this is something we'll be actively looking into um, in year two of our project. So to now look at some of the precip partitions. Um, uh, the key takeaways from this is we see a general transition from subgrid to more resolved as you go from 25 to 13 to three and similar results to the GFS where areas of active convection and or higher precipitation accumulations tend to be um, from resolved by the microphysics scheme and vice versa for the cumulus scheme. Um, quickly, I'll go over the precip precipitation partitions. The three kilometer run um, gets the total precipitation very well, I'd say um, for the, the simulation that we looked at, um, whereas the 25 and 13 tend to underdo the precipitation a little bit. Looking at the convective ratios, there's a fairly uniform um, step down in the convective ratio as you go from 25 to 13 to three. Um, so that does differ slightly from what we saw in the GFS physics. And we do see some um, higher um, convective ratios um, for the three kilometer runs, especially towards the end of the forecast lead time. So that's something to look into as well. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I obviously just showed a subset of what we were able to do, a lot of the subjective evaluation. We also have some sub, um, objective evaluation that we're looking into as well. And we're also looking at some additional runs that we performed with deep and or shallow convection turned off to better test the sensitivity of the cumulus parameterization at the convective allowing grid spacings. And as I mentioned before, we will be rerunning some of um, our results to get um, include the latest updates to the physics um, as well. 
And so just to summarize, I'll leave that up. Um, and then I also put in a plug for the DTC visitor program. We're currently working with Bill Gallus um, and John Thielen, and that's been a really great partnership so far. So if anybody else is interested in collaborating, um, please either reach out to us or look into more information on the visitor program. All right, so with that, I am I'm done. And I'm sorry about the slight technical glitch there. I don't currently see any questions on Slack. So I'll give it a, a minute for something to come in. Doesn't look like anyone is active there. So up next is Nick Leibarger. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, so you can share your screen. And uh, I'll also give you a warning at uh, two minutes. Okay. Can you hear me? You're very quiet. Very quiet. Um, is this any better? That's a little better. All right, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, diagnosing the track bias that we saw in uh, the UFS um, operational uh, model um, of Hurricane Barry. Uh, and this is part of a larger DTC project investigating the scalability of various UFS uh, physics suites. Um, Hurricane Barry uh, is an interesting case because we saw substantial right of track bias in UFS forecasts of up to 350 kilometers. It's a highly asymmetrical storm. Um, it, it occurred during a strong environment of northerly shear, and most of the convection occurred south of the TC center. Uh, oops, let me full screen that. Um, the physics suites we're going to be looking at are the GFS physics, physics suite GFDL MP, uh, GFS V15.2, and GFS V16 beta. You can see brief descriptions of each of these uh, given in the parentheses there. And the GSD physics suites are gonna be the GSD V0, uh, GSD NOAA, and what we're calling GSD uh, NOMI, which is GSD V0. Your screen just got cut off. It was better before. Um, okay, so should I just present like this? Yes. Okay. Um, and each of, uh, each of these runs are initialized in the UFS uh, short range weather application with GFS ICBCs. And so the first thing I'm going to show is the track bias that we see um, in each of these physics suites at various resolutions. You, if you look at the top row there, those are all the GFS physics suites we looked at. And uh, you can see that for GFS v15.2 and GFS v16 beta, the three kilometer run tracks most closely. The black dots there are the best track. They track most closely with the uh, best track early in the forecast, but later in the forecast, the 25 kilometer runs actually track a little bit more closely with the best track. Um, but all of them so show pretty substantial right of track bias. Um, and if we look at the GSD physics suites, um, we see kind of the opposite effect. For the GSD V0, the 3km and uh, 13km actually track best track pretty closely. And then for NOAA, and know me, we see that the 3km is actually a pretty good uh, track forecast, uh, whereas the 13 and the 25 show more significant bias. Um, and so the first thing I want to look at is the steering flow uh, that's guiding the uh, track as it uh, progresses through the forecast. And you can see that in the GFS physics suites, we see a pretty consistent um, eastward bias in the zonal flow. The zonal flow are the solid lines here and the meridional flow are the dotted lines. And we see the eastward track bias occurring um, in all three of these suites at all resolutions. However, in the three kilometer runs, which you've, if you recall, tracked most closely early in the runs, uh, they actually track pretty closely with uh, an ERA, ERA 5 uh, derived steering flow early in the run. And then around hour 18, um, they tend to diverge from ERA 5. And if we look at the GSD physics suites, we see uh, a kind of a similar pattern. Uh, generally, we see an eastward track bias in the zonal flow. Um, but early in the run, we actually see a westward track bias uh, for GSD NOAA and GSD NOMI. Uh, 
in the three kilometer runs, which uh, is later compensated by an eastward track bias uh, a little bit later in the run around hour 24. Um, so I think that's why those are tracking pretty closely is that the steering flow, although we see a westward bias early, it's compensated later by an eastward track bias. So I'm going to talk about a little physical mechanism that I'm going to describe here and try to show is occurring in these cases. Um, convective heating favors coupling between vortex centers on different vertical levels. So if we see overactive convection, that would tend to reduce vortex tilt and accelerate uh, precession more rapidly. And I have a little quote from uh, Gu et al. 2019 that you can read at your leisure. Um, the second point I want to make is that vortex warming follows from convective burst concentration in the down shear left and up shear left quadrants. In this case, that is the, to the southeast and northeast of the TC center. And I also want to say that when convective bursts occur further away from the TC center, it becomes less likely um, that the temperature advection associated with the superposition of mesoscale and convective scale substance will be advected into the storm center. So I've got a little schematic diagram that kind of describes uh, a little bit more clearly what I'm trying to say here. So if you see A, uh, that, is, that is representative of convective bursts occurring in the down shear left quadrant, whereas B here is convective bursts uh, occurring in the up shear left quadrant. And the idea here is that the convective scale subsidence, which is the dark blue circles, um, is superimposed on the mesoscale subsidence, which is the light blue uh, semicircle in the top half of each of these. It's just a coincidence that this schematic happens to show northerly wind shear. It uh, coincides with what we saw in Hurricane Barry. Uh, so the idea here is that when the mesoscale subsidence and the convective scale subsidence are superposed, uh, we tend to see more rapid warming of the TC center. And this is especially true when the convective bursts are close, uh, closer physically to the TC center. Um, and so here are some plots of vortex tilt for the GFS runs. And what I want to point out here is that, in general, the forecast runs show uh, more rapidly uh, uh, the vortex tilt decreases more rapidly in time than we see in ERA-5. And in addition, they actually precess in the opposite direction, generally, whereas ERA-5 moves uh, from about 180. It basically moves from quadrant 2 into quadrant 1. The forecast runs move from quadrant 2 into quadrant 3 and quadrant 4. And this uh, promotes convective activity in that down shear left and eventually the up shear left quadrant uh, once it reaches there. And we see a similar effect um, in the GSD suite. You can see they're precessing even more strongly in uh, the opposite direction, as we see in ERA-5. And uh, the vortex tilt is actually, the magnitude of the vortex tilt it changes quite rapidly. Uh, if you look at the three kilometer runs, you can see that as the forecast gets later on, uh, maybe around hour 24, the uh, vortex tilt angle tends to converge toward ERA-5 more strongly than the 25 and 13 kilometer runs. Um, so now I want to show, this is our 24 when the vortex tilt starts to uh, diverge. And uh, what we see here is that for the, in the GFS physics suites, we see strong convective activity in the up shear left quadrant. That is the northeast quadrant in this case. And it's relatively close to the TC center, especially for those runs that had more egregious track errors like uh, the GFDL MP. Uh, you can see that those white lines there are marked at 50 kilometers, uh, 100 kilometers, and 150 kilometers from the TC center. And we see convective aggregation occurring in the upshear left quadrant closer to the TC center. The GFSV 16 beta 25 kilometer run, which had the least track bias of all the GFS physics runs. Uh, two minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, shows almost no convection in that up to your left quadrant, um, which is consistent with the mechanism I'm describing here. And if we look at the GSD runs, all of the 25 and 13 kilometer runs show strong convective aggregation in that region, whereas the three kilometer runs show almost uh, no convection in that region at hour 24. Um, and there's also shown here the admittedly imperfect uh, verification set of ERA-5 preset there. Um, and 
I'm running out of time, so just to briefly go over these, uh, the idea is basically that when you see excess convection in the up shear left and uh, down shear left quadrants, that tends to warm the TC too strongly. And we see a strong warm bias in basically every run here. Uh, you, I, I would say just eyeballing it, the least, uh, the least bias that we see in the temperature, the vortex temperature anomaly is GFSV 16 beta 25 kilometer run. And uh, again, even with the, the GSD suites, we see uh, a strong vortex, a warm vortex temperature anomaly compared to ERA-5. And so just uh, to provide some conclusions in future work, um, the hypothesis here is that feedback between overactive convection and vortex tilt tends to produce convection in the down shear left and up shear left quadrants earlier in forecast runs compared to observe. And this induces convergence toward that aggreg aggregated convection, affecting the steering flow and introducing the right uh, track bias that we see. And the forecast runs also show warm bias in the vortex centers, uh, con consistent with the uh, convection bias in the up shear left quadrant. Um, and we intend to perform forecast runs with the convective uh, scheme turned off, although considering the relative fidelity of the 25 kilometer GFS runs, the convective scheme is not necessarily the only thing that's at fault here. And I think perhaps the superposition of the uh, scheme produced and results convection may be causing issues. And just to give a little teaser here, if we look at the partitioning between the parameterized and resolved convection, uh, these are just the GFS physics suites. We can see that those regions, the like down shear, uh, down shear left and up shear left quadrants close to the TC center are mostly resolved. And I think in those white areas between the purple areas and the green areas. I think uh, those are where the parameterized and resolved convection are superposed and are uh, overactive in producing the track errors that we see. That's all I have. Thank you. I don't see any questions on the Slack channel. So I will assume that we can move on to the talk by Lydia Stefanova. All right, thank you. Thank you. Does Nick have to? Ah, oh, sorry. I was wondering. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't quick on it. Okay, is my presentation appearing adequately? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to talk about the verification and evaluation and the development of the UFS S2S coupled prototypes. And I want to acknowledge my co-authors uh, who contributed substantially either through the evaluation verification itself or through the uh, making the development of the prototypes take place. So, uh, when in the process of developing a prototype and then evaluating it, there's several targets that we uh, look at. One is early in the, in the process, uh, we do extensive checking and monitoring for problems, looking for non-physical values or unexpected systematic differences from a previous prototype, uh, just to make sure that it's okay to, to proceed with a prototype. Another uh, type of evaluation is process validation, which is uh, something that uh, we have been working with ESRL, PSL Polar Processes team. They have developed a diagnostic toolkit, which is helpful for evaluating coupled processes in the Arctic specifically. Uh, but the focus of this talk is going to be the quantification of errors and skill that is conducted after a prototype is completed. So a testing system, uh, testing the system performance other, under a common framework, which allows us to uh, establish what progress we have made compared to compared to preceding prototypes, compared to any uh, other references, and sort of uh, let us know that we are on the right track. So I'll focus here on the atmospheric side mostly with some ice, uh, and there's going to be another uh, talk in the plenary session at 3.30 by Jian De Wang on the verification of the ocean in the couple prototypes. 
So a brief reminder, uh, uh, this is uh, a repeat of what Jessica was talking about in the plenary session earlier today, but these are the prototypes that we have run, run to date. Uh, generally, we try to change one thing at a time, uh, although always there's uh, inevitably between prototype launches, there are changes in the changes and upgrades in the model components that includes uh, upgrades, bug fix, fixes and the like. But the main targeted feature of the prototype is marked here in red. So we started with prototype one, which had initial conditions from CFSR for all components. Switching to prototype two, we changed the ocean initial conditions. Then in prototype three, we added the change of ice initial conditions. Then between prototype three and 3.1, there was a substantial changes, substantial upgrade in the code. So we gave that a clean benchmark of its own. So that was just code changes. And the most recent prototype four uh, had the addition of a WaveWatch 3 component in the coupled system. And just another thing that's relevant is that all prototypes to date have used the GFS version 15.2 physics settings. And the benchmark framework is that's the common, uh, common framework in which they're all tested after completion. Is, uh, it provides a consistent structure and fixed metrics. It consists of 35-day free forecasts in deterministic mode, so there, we don't have ensembles yet at this point. It spans April 2011th to March 2018th, uh, starting on the 1st and 15th of the month, so that's a total of seven years, 168 forecasts, if you count twice a month, every month. And that gives us a balance between having a sufficient length to do a meaningful statistical analysis of the results and, on the other hand, uh, conservative use of computing resources. Uh, this time period includes both El Nino and La Nina years, as well as years with recent low and high Arctic ice extent, so it's to some degree representative. So this is an example of something that we looked at. We look, we tend, we look at. This is for a particular benchmark, but the general structure is the same for all of them. Uh, this is a common feature. On the left is the bias of sea surface temperatures. Uh, on the top for January, on the bottom for July, and on the right is for the corresponding times the bias for net shortwave radiation in the surface. So the common features here is that the Warm, as it, there's warm SSD bias in the prototypes in all of them, uh, and it's more pronounced in the summer hemisphere. And another pronounced feature is the cold bias tongue in the Eastern Pacific. And the spatial structure and seasonality of the SSD bias corresponds pretty well to the bias of the net shortwave radiation. So this gives us a clue. For now, we're just uh, accumulating uh, information on what are the common problems. So this is one of them. And it tells us that uh, if we're looking for solutions for the SSD bias, uh, good clue to look into is the biases of shortwave radiation, so radiative and cloud processes. So this is another example of a metric that we look at. This is the area of ice covered ocean in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Averaged. This is a particularly an example for 2017. The black line is observations. The gray lines are the operational CFS v2. Dashed lines show forecast initialized on the 15th, and solid lines are forecast initialized on the 1st. So what jumps in the colored lines are two subsequent uh, benchmark or prototypes. So what jumps at us here immediately is that while the CFS v2 tended to persist generally the initial conditions uh, into the forecasts, the, the prototypes are closer, uh, bring it closer to the observations. And once we switched to the CPCI's initial conditions, which is the blue lines, the agreement became even better. Over 15%. Uh, this is now averaged over all years, uh, shown for three prototypes here. Common behavior is that there's a dip in scores in the summer period, and the scores are relatively, uh, remain relatively high in the winter periods. This is just giving us an idea that there's no 
uh, quantum leap in uh, how this particular metric is represented differently by the different prototypes. So the behavior between them is quite similar. Another metric that we look at is the anomaly correlations shown here specifically for conus. On the top is for two meter temperature and the bottom is for precipitation. Leftmost is week one, middle is week two, rightmost is weeks three and four combined. And this gives us a good idea. Again, this is a specific prototype, but the spatial structure is very similar between all of them, even if the total numbers vary a little bit. So the two meter temperature anomaly correlation starts off strong in week one and drops below uh, 0.5 by week two. And is still non-negligible though in weeks three and four, although it's uh, more pronounced in the center and northern part of the domain. Uh, for precipitation, anomaly correlation start off slightly above 0.5 in week one, dropping quite strongly uh, to below 0 0.2 uh, in the area average sense for uh, week two, and becoming almost imperceptible by week three and four. So if we look at the anomaly correlation skills for various metrics in week one on the left, week three and four on the right, uh, we see, so the gray bar is the reference CFS V2 operational. Almost all the prototypes in weeks three and four uh, for almost all metrics are performing uh, better. There is some exception with the, pre, uh, with the precipitation rate in the Nino 3.4 region, which in which they all agree pretty much. Uh, not, not that all, all agree, but all have a similar performance around 0.5. So one of the big leaps that we had is in the predictability of sea surface temperatures that came from switching to the ocean initial conditions. But other than that, uh, relatively, we can say that the anomaly correlations are holding steady and uh, they compare well to CFSV2. And the final thing to, that I want to show you is the skill for MGO. Uh, on the left is the, are the decay curves for uh, two prototypes in green and red and for CFS V2 in black. And on the right is summarized for all prototypes and compared to CFS V2, the lead time that it takes for the MGO anomaly correlation to fall down to either 0 0.6 or 0 0.5, depending on whether you look at the blue or red bars. And the main message here is that in all the prototypes, we have the lead time increased by five to seven days over the operational CFS V2. So all of this is good news. And to summarize, so all prototypes to date do exhibit similar spatial and temporal structures of systematic errors that deserve further looking into. Uh, but they consistently outperform the operational CFS V2 for anomaly correlation scale at weeks three and four for most metrics. And the skill across prototypes is holding relatively steady. Uh, we expect to find future performing gains from uh, some of the planned component physics improvements and from tuning later on, as well as from advances in, in initialization, uh, for example, via the LAN DA. And finally, some of the near future prototypes that we have planned include switching to the CMIPS, uh, including fractional masks, switching to size six, and then going to GFS version 16 physics. And that's it, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. I do not see any questions. And in the interest of time, we'll, um move on to the talk by Kerry Kodama. Very sorry if I mispronounced your name. And I will give you a warning at two minutes as well. Okay, no, you're good. One second. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Trying to find, trying to find my screen. Oh, it's not letting me screen share. Do you want me to share my screen? Um, hang on, let me. 
short one more time. It says you must grant permissions in order to screen share. Okay, I guess you should just share it then. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, all right. So this was work that was done in collaboration with uh, David Strauss and James Kinter at the Center for Ocean, Land, Atmosphere Studies at George Mason University. And uh, funding, uh, this project was supported by funding from uh, the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, next slide. Um, it's not advancing. All right. Can you see the next slide now? Yes. OK. Uh, so as the title suggests, uh, our main objectives are to evaluate biases in the UFS Benchmark 3 tests uh, using comparisons um, to subseasonal reef forecasts from the SubX project. And we're specifically focusing on surface variables, two meter air temperature, precip, SST, as well as the diabetic heating in the troposphere. Um, and this analysis is all done on weekly averages um, from weeks one through four and stratified by season. Um, so while mean biases are the main focus, uh, we're also gonna briefly highlight some assessments of the forecast skill. Um, a lot of these results will have some similarities with the talk that Lydia just gave, so. Um, so, first of all, the models that we're using, that we're analyzing, are CFSV2 from NSEP and the CCSM4 from Rasmus. Uh, that's taken from the sub X, uh, the subseasonal prediction experiment. Um, and then we're also looking at the uh, prototype three from the UFS, um, which is used to create the benchmark three test series. Um, just briefly, sub the sub X project um, is an Prediction experiment intended to evaluate and improve forecasting skill on seasonal to subseasonal time scales. And the participating model groups each followed a standardized sub X protocol that established the minimum requirements for the reforecasts. So, as such, the two sub X models both span the years 1999 to 2014 and each have an ensemble uh, size of four members. And we're going to be looking at the ensemble means for the purposes of our analysis. And they're initialized at a minimum of, of once per week uh, and run out to uh, 45 days of lead time. Uh, meanwhile, the benchmark three reforecasts, um, the prototype three is run on the configuration shown there. Um, I think that's a typo at mom five. It should be, I think it should be mom six. Um, and as Lydia mentioned, uh, it goes from uh, March, April 2011 to March 2018 with one ensemble member and it initialized twice per month on the 1st and 15th uh, out to 35 days of lead. Next slide. So since there's a large number of results, we're just going to go on a bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the highlights. Uh, next slide. Uh, so briefly, I wanted to highlight uh, the evolution of standard deviation. So in the sub X models, we find that there is a diminution of uh, variability as lead time increases, um, but this is not the case in UFS. We see that the variability maintains consistency throughout the full span of leads, as you can see from the comparison between uh, two meter air temperature from weeks one through three for CFS and UFS, for example. Um, and this consistency is present as um, in precip as well as SST for UFS. Next slide. So at the same time, uh, skill decreases pretty rapidly with lead time. Um, again, showing a comparison between weeks one and three for CFS and UFS. Um, but this is exhibited across all of the models we analyze. Um, so UFS uh, correlations are quite, uh, well, for both the correlations are quite strong uh, in week one, um, but by week three, uh, ACC is near or below 0 0.1 and even less for precipitation. 
Um, so scale beyond week two remains a difficulty um, even moving forward. Uh, next slide. And in the interest of time, our analysis of the bias will focus on CONUS for two meter air temperature and precip, and then on the Pacific for SST. Um, here, the two meter air temperature percent error is shown for all three of the models. Um, the biases are computed with respect to CPC temp verification data set and are normalized with respect to the interquartile range of the observed season. Um, so here we're showing winter for weeks one and three for all three of the models. Um, CFS and UFS have similar biases overall, although CFS appears to have a slight of warm initialization error over Canada that fades out as lead time increases. Um, this is not present in uh, UFS. Um, and by week three, CFS is too cold in most regions. Um, comparatively, CCSM4 has the largest biases overall, especially in areas of elevation, um, such as the Rockies. Um, meanwhile, in week three, by week three, UFS has the low, uh, lower percentage errors um, in the south, especially than the other two models, um, and is has the lowest error when averaged spatially, while the other two have a negative bias in the spatial average by week three. Next slide. Um, so the same comparison is done for precip. Uh, this time the percent error is normalized with respect to the observed seasonal mean of precip uh, due to the non-normal distribution of precip kind of skewing the interquartile range and making it not feasible. Um, and these are computed with respect to the NASA GPCP uh, daily rainfall product. So while well, both weeks one and three were shown in the previous slide uh, to give a sense of evolution of error with lead, uh, we're now gonna focus um, our attention on week three only to instead show the variation between the seasons. So now we're focusing just on week three with summer at the top and winter at the bottom now. Um, so the advantages of UFS are more apparent here. Um, again, CCSM4 has a more different structure from the other two um, with a mix of quite large biases, both positive and negative overall seasons. Um, the other two models are generally more balanced. And again, UFS does better, slightly better in the South. Um, although all models have to some degree an issue with a too dry Gulf Coast in the summer. And then on the other hand, winter is generally dominated by wet biases, especially in CFS. Um, which is considerably too rainy almost everywhere. Um, comparatively, UFS winter prediction errors are lower. Um, and generally, any of the high values could partially be caused by the fact that the mean precip uh, can be quite low in a lot of the drier regions, which would uh, inflate the relative error, um, even though there's the absolute errors are still quite small. Uh, next slide. So now just move in the interest of time moving, just gonna briefly highlight Pacific SST. And this is normalized by the interquartile range as with the two meter air temperature and verified against uh, NOAA OI SST, daily SST. Um, CCSM4 actually has fairly low error, relative error in contrast to the previous two variables. Um, the other two models have a larger percent error, particularly in the warm pool region. Although this is, um, largely in part uh, due to the yeah, fact that the left. Okay, um, this is largely due to the fact that the variability is quite low in the warm pool. Um, so the absolute errors here are uh, less than one degree Celsius. Um, but in general, uh, CCSM4 Pacific is too cold, especially in the extra tropics of the summer hemisphere. Uh, and the other two models are generally too warm. Next slide. And then finally, also briefly, uh, just noting some errors in diabetic heating, which is verified against ERA-5. Uh, the heating uh, is, it was averaged over the vertical layers from 875 to 125 hectopascals in UFS, um, and the nearest available layers in ERA-5. But the main finding here is that the storm tracks in UFS uh, have insufficient, appear to have insufficient heating. Uh, with values around zero for both the Atlantic and Pacific storm tracks. And so we hypothesize that this might be due to either insufficient convection or too much radiative cooling in the upper troposphere. 
but we would need more data to narrow this down further. Next slide. So just to briefly summarize, um, UFS uh, performs pretty well compared to the sample uh, sub X experiments. And uh, overall, the reforecast bias is relatively low. Um, and this is especially in consideration of the sample size, which is smaller than the sub X sample size. And sensitivity experiments showed that um, with a smaller, more sparse sample uh, error, the biases tend to be larger. So the deck is kind of stacked against UFS in these comparisons here. So uh, it seems to look pretty good in uh, comparison to the sub X. Um, difficulty still remains with skill beyond week two, and um, there's that uh, diabetic heating error uh, where the storm tracks are considerably too weak that we have yet to diagnose. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. And let me stop sharing. Great. I don't see any questions on the Slack channel. And so what we will do is move on to the next presenter. OK, uh, this is Edmund Chan. Uh, I see my screen now. Yes, it looks good. OK, so uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about developing week three to four Storminus Outlook 2 based on the NSAP dynamic forecast systems. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my uh, collaborator, Wen Chiu Wang uh, of NOAA CPC. And uh, for storminess, uh, what I mean is uh, winter storms or extratropical cyclones. Uh, uh, you can see uh, a, a nice uh, set of picture here of a storm uh, affecting the Northeast. Uh, the reason why we like to do it is that because uh, extratropical cyclones, they provide significant impacts on the society and ecosystem. Uh, if we look at the tracks, uh, on the pick, pick to the right, which shows uh, the tracks of uh, storms in a season, uh, you know, in one winter season. Uh, individual tracks uh, generally uh, can maybe be predictable out, out to about a week, uh, but for week two and beyond, uh, storm statistics uh, or storminess is uh, more useful. Uh, currently, NOAA CPC does provide week two storminess outlook based on gaps ensemble. Uh, this is the web page, uh, and they provide uh, basically uh, two different types of information. Uh, one is the um, week two forecast for uh, cyclone uh, track density uh, and uh, intensity and the anomaly, uh, the anomaly on the left, uh, on the right, and the uh, total number on the left, as well as uh, the uh, information about the weather uh, associated with them. Uh, but this is for week two uh, based on uh, daily uh, gaps ensemble. So uh, similar outlook for weeks three to four will be useful uh, for many stakeholders. Uh, I, I've just listed uh, a few here. And that's why we uh, would like to um, develop uh, weeks three to four storminess outlook two, and uh, we are planning to use the combined CFS v2 and uh, GAPS version 12, which is the UFS uncoupled S2S uh, subseasonal ensemble, uh, to use this uh, combined ensemble. And uh, we plan to evaluate uh, these outlooks using uh, CFS v2 and GAPS version 12 hindcast as well as the CFS version 2 operational forecast data which uh, is available which has been available since uh, 2011 and we plan to develop a web page to provide near real time weeks three to four storminess outlook uh, which will uh, also provide information on climatology interpretation as well as verification now uh, the prior results that motivate us to do that uh, was uh, uh, was submitted uh, in the paper uh, by one of my former graduate students, uh, Chen Zheng, uh, to weather forecasting. And in that paper, we evaluated uh, uh, the storminess forecast uh, in the sub X data. 
Uh, here, I'll just focus on CFS version 2 and the GAPS uh, version 11, which is the pre-UFS version of GAPS, uh, which is uh, currently in the, uh, in the sub-X database. So uh, storminess can be defined uh, in several different ways. Uh, I, I showed you figures uh, previously on uh, things like track density and, uh, and uh, amplitude. Uh, it can also be defined as variance of uh, synoptic time scale sea level pressure at each grid box. So uh, the physical uh, reason behind that is that uh, the passage of cyclones over uh, any region will provide rapid uh, pressure change. And so if we look at the pressure difference uh, and take the variance of the pressure difference, uh, when there are strong cyclones or, or many cyclones uh, passing within a period, uh, the variance will be bigger. And this is the cli winter climatology. Uh, you can see the uh, strongest uh, activity extend across the Pacific, across uh, northern North America into uh, the Atlantic, into Europe. So this uh, actually coincides with the uh, regions where extreme tropical cyclone uh, tend to track over. In that uh, study, uh, we evaluated uh, the CFS version 2 and GAPS ensemble here. Uh, for the CFS version 2 uh, in the re-forecast uh, for sub-X, uh, there's one forecast every uh, six hours. And so we take a four-day lag ensemble of 16 member, and then the GAFs are uh, 11 member every week. And so uh, this is a 27 member ensemble. Here, uh, we evaluate against the, the storminess uh, as computed based on Yahweh interim uh, reanalysis. Uh, for week two and week three to four. Uh, you can see that uh, in general, uh, the scale, uh, obviously, uh, this is the anomaly correlation and, uh, uh, coefficient. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the scale does uh, decrease from week two to week three to four, which is not uh, surprising. Uh, but overall, they are high over the similar regions uh, across the Pacific. Uh, close to Alaska and North and North America and across the Atlantic into Europe. Um, so in, uh, we also look at the source of uh, predictability. Uh, part of the scale is related to the ENSO uh, as well as the polar vortex. So on the left, uh, I reproduce the week three to four scale by the uh, ensemble. Uh, the, uh, in the middle panel is the uh, the correlation between the interim derived uh, storminess with the ONI, uh, and so uh, Ocean Nino Index, uh, which shows a high correlation over uh, uh, some of the regions, uh, especially Alaska, uh, Pacific, and some part of the Atlantic. Uh, so uh, some of the predictability there are due to ENSO. And then uh, on the right, uh, this decoration between the polar vortex index uh, with the storm, storminess. And you can see that uh, it affects the uh, region of the Atlantic. Uh, but the, right now, the, cur uh, the current work, uh, the project's just starting. And so we're starting to evaluate the operational CFS version 2 and the, uh, the UFS uh, GAPS version 12 uh, hindcast prediction skill. Uh, we expect that to improve upon the results uh, that we had uh, that I just showed in the previous slide uh, due to the fact that operational CFS version 2 has four members per six hour cycle and uh, the evaluation that we just did uh, just use one member per cycle. And then GAPS version 12 uh, uh, is expected to improve over GAPS version 11. Uh, for example, BJ's talk yesterday as well as, uh, yeah. So uh, we will also evaluate ensemble prediction of cyclone track statistics. Uh, yeah, this project is just starting and uh, we'll, uh, we'll update uh, in the next uh, UFS meeting. Thank you. I do not see any 
questions on the Slack channel. And in the interest of time, I believe what we should move on to the presentation by Carl Schreck. Let's see. Are you guys uh, able to see and hear me? Yes, we are. Very good. Um, thank you. So yeah, I'm Carl Schreck from uh, North Carolina State University in uh, the Cooperative Institute in Asheville, located at NCEI. And I'll be talking about uh, sources of subseasonal skill in uh, the CFS V2. So key things I want you to take away from this is that it turns out that in CFS V2, most of the subseasonal rainfall skill actually comes from persistent uh, ENSO effects. So like the response to the SST anomalies, not even like forecasting the uh, actual uh, evolution of those SSTs. And I'm, I'm sharing this from CFS, figuring that you know the, these could be useful diagnostics for UFS in the future. MJO does contribute uh, to some of the skill over the Indian Ocean, at least. Um, but using this unique method of filtering time casts, I think, can identify some of the potential sources of skill, as well as some of the missed opportunities, like you know, some of the MJO signal. This is based largely on a MJO monitoring website that I maintain, nkicks.org slash MJO. Uh, this is something I developed in collaboration with CPC several years ago for Dynamo, and has a variety of different MJO and equatorial wave diagnostics. And so what I'm doing here is using the CFS reforecast uh, hindcast from 99 to 2010 and verifying the rainfall forecast against trim 3B42. And so on the left-hand side here, you can see the, you know, this is essentially taking a full time series of observed rainfall anomalies and filtering it for uh, low frequency, like 120 days and longer. So like ENSO effects basically in the, in the pink. Uh, the black is MJO, the blue is Kelvin waves, and the red are equatorial Rossby waves. And the shading is the actual anomalies. In the middle, we're doing what we're calling observational padding. So this is essentially pretending that you have a perfect forecast for 45 days by just using the observations to see what impact using the uh, just doing the filter versus the unfiltered would have because naturally those contours are never going to match up with all of the details of the unfiltered shading that you see. And the far right is instead using the CFS hindcast. So it's observations up until November 15th, and then 45 days of forecast data, and then essentially zero anomalies or climatology uh, from there on. And this kind of mashing up of the data is necessary because 4A filtering doesn't really work well on endpoints. And so if you saw Maria Gens' uh, presentation yesterday, their solution is to kind of slice one particular uh, forecast lead and stitch together all of the model runs at that forecast lead. What I'm doing instead is taking an individual forecast, but using the full 45 day run and then stitching it together with observations and climatology. And I'll be verifying this against a high to key skill score uh, like what they use at CPC. So first, kind of looking at the what's the skill of this observational padding, just to get an idea of how much signal is there in the different filter bands. And what we see is this is the um, Heidecky skill score for, a, for effectively a week three forecast. It's not too sensitive to the time frame. Um, but the low frequency, that 120 days and longer, there's quite a bit of skill over the INSO region. That's not a huge surprise. SST anomalies relate directly to uh, rainfall anomalies there. If you look at the MJO band, there's quite a bit of uh, power over the Indian Ocean, hardly any in the Western Pacific. And that's because the MJO and equatorial Rossby wave bands, these are band pass filters. So if you sum them up over a long time or a long wavelength, they have to sum to zero. And if you have a really strong El Nino, you're going to have enhanced convection over the Western Pacific. 
And even the strongest suppressed phase of the MJO is probably not going to make it be suppressed rainfall. It's probably just going to get you back down to normal or something like that. So what I find is more useful is to kind of look at these waves in combination. So if I add the MJO anomalies on top of the low frequency, so that's essentially like adding the black and the magenta contours together and seeing the skill of those, how does that compare to the skill of the magenta, the low frequency by itself? And you know, again, the MJO really contributes the most over the Indian Ocean um, lesser degree over the maritime continent and still really doesn't add much over the uh, Western Pacific. Uh, similarly, uh, equatorial Rossby waves add a little bit more, uh, especially in the Indian Ocean, but it's, it's uh, mostly, the equatorial Rossby waves are mostly showing up in regions of tropical cyclone activity. So that was for, a, for filtered observations. This is for the actual CFS V2 for week three. And so the top row is the unfiltered anomaly. So that's shading in the Hoff Mullers I showed earlier. And skill is actually pretty decent over most of the tropics uh, for week three. But when you take a look at the second row, you see that most of that skill is actually coming from the low frequency band. In fact, the low frequency band is higher skill at week three than the unfiltered. So that means that any subseasonal weather that the model is producing is actually detracting from the model skill over that region. Um, but when you do add the MJO, you do get some additional skill over the uh, Indian Ocean, certainly not nearly what you would get from uh, if it was a perfect forecast, but you do get something there. And equatorial Rossby waves, again, don't really add a whole lot. So another thing I've done is take a look at how the difference in skill between the low frequency and the low frequency plus MJO varies by season and region. And so this is focusing on the Indian Ocean, where the skill was the strongest for the uh, MJO contribution. And so anywhere you see a red dot, that's somewhere where the CFS's MJO is actually improving the skill over just kind of a low frequency persistence type forecast. And it makes sense that as the MJO goes from weak to moderate to strong, you tend to get more enhanced skill from the MJO. Um, kind of surprising to me that you actually get more enhancement of the skill during the spring versus uh, the winter and really I mean, less surprising that the MJO doesn't really help you nearly as much uh, during the summer, especially when the MJO is in phases like one, two, three, or four. So if, if the MJO is upstream of the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, it makes sense that you're not going to have a lot of uh, skill at that point. And so uh, just kind of to summarize the key points again, you know, um, most of the skill in the CFS is really coming from essentially persistence of uh, the ENSO effects. Um, I'd be very curious to see how that's similar. Or about different. two minutes. All right, I'm wrapping up. Um, so I'd be very curious to see how that's similar or different in UFS and other models. And uh, MJO does contribute over the Indian Ocean, but probably not as much as it could if the model really had a really robust MJO. Um, and I should point out that these are all based on rainfall instead of the RMM that uh, most folks are usually verifying the MJO against. And rainfall is just a lot noisier where the RMM is more sensitive to the circulation, which is going to be a lot smoother. So this is probably a tougher but more realistic test of that. And uh, I, I really think this uh, filtered hindcast method shows a lot of promise for identifying some of these uh, um, potential opportunities. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions if there's time. Thank you.